Um, you should know uh, that at this symposium, when the planners came together, uh, the themes that were distilled and the sub-themes from them and the speakers who um, they chose, uh, they wanted all academic experts uh, because they wanted sub substantive reflection on, um, on the richness that we can find in the church's teachings that are articulated in Humana Vitae. And unfortunately, no one has done any, any writing, serious writing, on pastoral efforts or even on catechetical efforts. Um, and yet still, we, we have to reflect a little bit on the pastoral, and, and that's what I'm going to do for, Tim, I'm sorry, maybe 12 minutes. <laughs> I'm supposed to do 10. Uh, but let me say this, to reflect upon diocesan NFP ministry is to see, in my opinion, a profound inspiring sign of hope. Uh, at first glance, one might expect me to identify that hope in the number of many NFP advances as what we have discussed today. Even in the rise of education in theology of the body, which we know now has a presence in Catholic seminaries and universities, or in the innovations regarding NFP education, such as e-learns and apps and internet in general, all of which I have to say look rather fancy and might cause one to think that they are the sources of our pastoral hope. Uh, but that is not what I'd like to shine the light on. The real hope lies in the fact that NFP in the dioceses is a ministry. And I can't emphasize that enough. In fact, the founder of uh, my program, Bishop James T. McHugh, constantly underscored that NFP is a ministry. And as with all ministries in the church, diocesan NFP ministry is an expression of God's call regarding a particular task. Whom shall I send, he says, and in this case, God's call is to specific people to help others embrace his plan for married love through NFP education. Now the faithful response of the diocesan NFP leader, here I am, Lord, send me, is worth more, in my opinion, than any app, e-learn, or internet educational uh, innovation that we can create. And so this is my point, and this is my main point, I could walk off the stage right now, that the, those people who have generously answered yes to God's call are the signs of hope in diocesan NFP ministry. Now in order to help you appreciate what I have learned, I'd like to give you um, uh, a brief tour of diocesan NFP ministry. And I would like to look at the leaders themselves and one characteristic in particular. Uh, and before I take you, take you on that tour, um, I'd like to do a true trip down memory lane. And Richard does uh, talk about this in his paper uh, at length. So I'm just going to briefly mention it because it really is stellar. And that is 50 years ago, the US bishops created the Human Life Foundation. Later, it was called the Human Life and NFP Foundation. And this was initiated by three bishops who were really under siege at the time with all of the dissent that was swirling around Humana Vitae, one of whom was Cardinal O'Boyle of the Archdiocese of Washington. They invested a million dollars to support NFP research and its promotion. Um, and in any case, I begin with this because the church's teachings, we can say, especially with regard to church leader, precisely because of church teaching, we might say that church leaders have a responsibility to offer practical help, as Familiaris Consortio says, to those who wish to live out their parenthood in a truly responsible way. And I would like to take a moment to acknowledge um, one of the founders here, Mary Kay Williams, who is with us. If you would stand up, Mary. She was the assistant director of this foundation. Thank you. She really is an inspiration. Well, um, taking a look at diocesan uh, uh, NFP ministry, I'm going to tell you first what it looks like right now. Uh, you're going to think that, well, this is pretty normal. 
So today in the diocese, NFP ministry provides education, of course, in NFP and church teachings, which support its use in marriage. And the ministry is most commonly integrated into the structure of the diocese with an NFP coordinator appointed by the bishop. The diocesan NFP coordinator is typically paid full or part-time and is usually an NFP user or a teacher. Most diocesan services can be found under the Office of Marriage and Family Life, although they do exist in other departments as well. They typically have a volunteer staff of teachers of various methods. They provide a variety of classes throughout the diocese and have a presence in marriage preparation. They also provide outreach education to a variety of audiences and are often engaged in fertility appreciation chastity education as well. As I said, these simple facts about current diocesan and NFP ministry and most dioceses, I have to say at this point in time, um, have identifiable programs, okay? So, so most dioceses have a program. Now, some 30 years ago, however, and I hate to date myself, but when I started Xeroxing and filing for Bishop McHugh 30 years ago, the majority of dioceses did not formally recognize NFP ministry. In fact, it was often debated as to whether it was appropriate for the diocese to offer NFP. And that was mostly because of the medical look of NFP education. It was often argued that a Catholic hospital or a Catholic physician's office should provide these services. Now, there were always a handful of, of exceptions. There were some truly insightful bishops and laypersons who came together in a perfect symphony of talent, and, um, and they built programs right from the beginning. I think of the Diocese of Phoenix, I think of the Diocese of Cleveland, even in New York at the time. Uh, so there were examples of, of uh, unique approaches. But the majority, however, did not have NFP, uh, and they certainly didn't have it in marriage ministry. Now, in the late 1980s, it was common for the diocesan coordinator to be a volunteer and an NFP teacher who was loosely attached to the diocese. The coordinator was typically a married woman with small children, and she worked out of her home. There were many times where I would be on the phone and a baby would be screaming or children, toddlers be getting into trouble, and I would have to wait patiently as mom would correct the kids. Well, these hardy souls were often asked by someone in the diocese um, to uh, take over NFP. And yet, even though they were asked, whenever they had a project to move forward in the dioceses, they would often uh, face interference from some chancery staff. In those years, when I first began to work for the Bishop's NFP program, I spent many an hour advising the NFP coordinator, and it is not an exaggeration to say that the majority of our consultations had to do with helping the coordinator devise a strategy to convince that chancery person to help them. And I'm telling you, that rarely happens today. It's inspiring also to note that some of our coordinators made a conscious decision at the time to love the very people who were running the interference on their ministry. And to that end, they would do things like volunteer to take part in other diocesan projects that maybe even had nothing to do with NFP, but it went the distance in establishing relationships and good relationships at that. And I would often get the um, happy um, uh, news from a coordinator coordinator saying something like, well, now they know me and they, they know church teaching is good and they know that NFP works and they know I'm not crazy. Now, nationally speaking, uh, through the Bishop's Conference, and we have to thank for the Bishop's NFP program, uh, the, the Synod on the Family of 1980 and Cardinal Cook of New York, who was inspired to do something pastoral that was more proactive to help um, the, the married couples. And he had Bishop McHugh, who had founded the Bishop's um, Pro-Life Activities um, Secretariat, uh, he had him take over devising a pastoral plan for um, diocesan NFP ministry. And so, uh, nationally speaking, the Bishop's NFP program did contribute to this promotion of church teaching and NFP in the dioceses. And it was done in such a way where Bishop McHugh consciously tried to mitigate a lot of um, opposition. 
So what he did in the early days, he traveled the nation. He met priests, he met diocesan bishops, he, made, he met uh, chancery staff, uh, lay people, physicians, scientists, he wrote articles, he held meetings. Uh, he really put his finger on the pulse of what was going on at the grassroots level, and he devised many, many strategies. Now, I could really go on with a full lecture of the amazing contributions that he made in this area, but I'm only going to single out one for you today, and that is his creation of the National Standards for Diocesan NFP Ministry. Uh, and the importance of the standards has to do with this. In the past, despite the fact that we had all this passion for serving the church and church teachings on NFP, there was a kind of ministerial chaos that reigned in the dioceses. There was fierce rivalry, um, and it was certainly an obstacle to NFP growth in the dioceses. Again, in general, we can say that the leaders, the teachers, they were united in their common desire to fight the contraceptive wave that swept the world. And they did, it, of course, under the rubrics of church teaching. They greatly differed, however, on a number of points. One, of course, a very central one being which was the most effective NFP method. And there were so many other points that they disagreed upon. And I'm talking about real minutia, like what should be in the curricula for the um, well-trained NFP teacher and that kind of thing. Uh, the list was so extensive and the infighting was just so common that many diocesan coordinators would contact Bishop McHugh and they would say, do something about this. We just can't go forward. You have to do something. So what he did was he uh, formed a certification committee in the 1980s. And by 1990, they produced the standards for uh, diocesan natural family planning ministry, which the administrative board of bishops approved. These standards have an implementation process that is attached to it. It's a formal process, and we have a current advisory board that um, is trying, has actually revamped that implementation process to, to encourage more dioceses to formally use it. I, I can tell you right now the majority informally use it, and part of the problem there is too many of our directors at this point in time are wearing way too many hats in the dioceses, and so uh, we have to figure out a way to make the formal process less burdensome. In any case, I'll stop there regarding that contribution as an example, and let me just say a word about the directors themselves. Uh, and, and this is only in my 30 years of working with these people. I have to tell you there is one trait that is common to absolutely every single one of them, and this is even internationally because I've met people from Germany, Italy, uh, France, uh, and uh, Africa, uh, and that is perseverance. Uh, I really do believe that God gifts these people with this, uh, this quality of perseverance. So when confronted with challenges, NFP leaders pray, they think, they act, and if whatever they implement doesn't work, they try something different. In other words, they do not give up. Now, of course, they may whine, they may badger some people, they, they may get bitter too, but eventually they'll even put the bitterness down because they don't stay down for the count. They get up to fight again and to fight again and to fight again. Now, this ability to persevere gives often the appearance of um, of um, the ministry kind of taking a, a sort of zigzag approach. It doesn't really look like it goes in a straight line. Uh, and that's because the wider culture, as what we've heard in our symposium, um, has been completely opposing everything that natural family planning and church teaching is about. And so having obstacles of, ig uh, of, of physicians who are ignorant about the methods of NFP or having obstacles of, of, of diocesan staff, leaders who don't really understand and have a profound understanding and acceptance of church te teaching has gotten in the way. Um, one of their areas, and I'll just end with this, um, uh, is marriage preparation in NFP. And at one point in time, there was a culture of silence in the dioceses, as I said, where NFP was not spoken about in marriage preparation. Today, 
marriage preparation includes NFP because of these this years of work of these people. And the people are lay people, they're clergy, they're religious. It's a good mix of, 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 of people in the church. Um, uh, and here's where we've got the zigzag. At one end of the spectrum, we have uh, maybe those dioceses that just give out pamphlets and do a little bit of information. And then we have other dioceses that actually have a full class of NFP as a requirement for marriage preparation. And that group is small right now. We have about 12 dioceses that do that, but we have over 22 that are formally looking at how they can implement that in their dioceses. And I keep getting calls, honestly, weekly. I, you know, I'll get a handful of calls each week or, or emails saying that they would like to do the same and who can I talk to who has already done it. So we've been trying to um, to give them uh, examples and resources on our website as well. So let me end with Paul VI one more time, because as I said, the hope that I see in diocesan NFP ministry is the NFP leader, him or herself, who has answered God's call. And Paul VI, at the end of the encyclical of Humanae Vitae, he addresses bishops, and I think that even though he addresses bishops, these words are important for the NFP leader because when they work in the diocese, they assist the bishop in his ministry. And Pope Paul said, great indeed is the work of education, of progress, and of charity to which we now summon all of you. And we are convinced that this truly great work will bring blessings both on the world and on the church. For man cannot attain that true happiness for which he yearns with all the strength of his spirit unless he keeps the laws which the most high God has engraved in his very nature. Thank you.